Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event in partnership with IWG and DealRoom. This is our fourth in the Unfiltered E2E series. My name, for those of you that don't know me, uh, is Shalini Kempka, and I'm the founder and chief executive of E2E. It's a huge privilege for me today to be in conversation with Colin Breyer and Bill Carr, both former senior executives of the Global Colossus and the ultimate scale-up business that is no other than Amazon. Their tenure was during the years of Amazon's unrivaled innovation and growth. Uh, they are the right-hand men to, they have been the right-hand men to Jeff Bezos, who, as we know, is one of the most celebrated and influential entrepreneurs of our time. Um, they are also the co-authors of this fabulous book called Working Backwards. If you don't have it, you should get it. It's Working Backwards, Insights, Stories, and Secrets from Inside Amazon. And, the co and they are the co-founders of Working Backwards, LLC. Recent years have required rapid change and innovation in growth in all entrepreneurial endeavors. Technology especially has advanced at a, st uh, at a strategic rate and at a stratospheric rate. Uh, however, rapid change demands solid processes and guiding principles. There's no other exemplary company than Amazon whose processes and, innovation, in, in, and innovative approach have been uh, fabled. Therefore, who better than the entrepreneurs to learn from than these two former senior executives of Amazon? Uh, so, so tonight we will uh, we will learn how Bill and Colin, these are the two gentlemen right at the top of my screen, one's wearing a blue shirt, one's wearing a grey shirt, um, who helped to build Amazon into 1.16 trillion, and I have to pinch myself when I read that figure, 1.16 trillion dollar business it is today, and how they coach and advise executives and entrepreneurs in both large and early stage companies globally drawing on their time at Amazon. So, you know, if, you're, if you are lucky enough to be supported by these two gentlemen, you are learning from the creme de la creme. And it's the recipe for success by working backwards, which we will learn about. Um, they explain how they have refined their wealth of experience into a winning business formula that is reputable, scalable, and adaptable for all entrepreneurs. They reveal, and I'm looking forward to this, um, to the gentleman, they reveal how Jeff Bezos and his te senior management team took their guiding principles and practices into a, an entirely new level of focus uh, and um, implementation, culminating in the success of one of the most extraordinary companies the world has ever known. From the famous 14 leadership principles, the bar raising, hiring process, and Amazon's founding characteristics, customer obsession, long-term thinking, eagerness to invent, and the operational excellence. Many people doubted Amazon's radical approach, but for more than two decades now, Amazon has achieved all their found founding characteristics and more. The road to being an Amazonian starts here. So if anyone is, is inspired to, to be an Amazonian like me, um, please listen carefully to tonight. So if you're an entrepreneur, building, scaling, or selling a business. We hope that you'll find tonight's event informative, interactive, and that you'll be in touch with us to assist you further. So before I take you through this evening's format and our premium membership, I'd also like to run through some of the housekeeping, and I'd like to request that you keep your cameras, please keep your cameras on, um, but please turn your mics off. Uh, until we get to the Q&A. And when we get to the Q&A, we want it to be as interactive as possible. So in the Q&A, please use the chat function and then uh, we'll ask you to put your mic on and, uh, and, and chat to us through, uh, through the Zoom function. So on the bottom hand right, you will see the, the chat function and you'll also have um, the raising hands button, so please use that one. Um, so please do have a look. It depends on what version of Zoom you're on. So now, without further ado, I'd like to take you through the format, and I'd also like to introduce you to Steve Medencia. Um, Steve is the gentleman, I, I don't know where he is right now, can you see him? Yes, he's on the right of my screen. And I have to thank Steve, he's the amazing founder of Fantastic. I'll introduce him uh, carefully later on, but I'd like to say thank you to him, because without him, I wouldn't have met Bill or Colin, and it's because of, that, of him that we are doing this event. So Steve, I want to say a huge thank you, and I'll introduce you formally when you come on in a second. So, My pleasure. Uh, is that okay, Steve? Perfect. Perfect, okay. So 
So without further ado, I just wanted to talk you through the format of the evening. So next up will be Richard Morris. I think for many of you who've been on our events before, Richard Morris is the chief executive of IWG Group. IWG is the world's largest uh, workspace company. Uh, they have about 3,300 offices uh, around the world, but he'll talk you through that and they are our partner for, for today, along with DealRoom. So if you're looking for the best data and private markets data, DealRoom is the company to speak to. And Douglas Traffelet, who's the chief commercial officer, he will be talking to us about some of the um, global trends and intelligence for startups in the UK. So right now, I'd like to just hand over, if I may, um, to, uh, to Richard. If I, can we see Richard? Is Richard on? If he is not, I will ask Doug. No, I am. I am on. Can you okay. hear me? Perfect. Can you, hear me? you can hear me. Can you see me? Okay, then. I can see you now, Richard. Thank you very much. So I'd like to hand over to Richard. Richard, thank you very much for... Um, your support and um, partnership of E2E and everyone's keen to hear from you um, as to our partnership. So I'll hand over to you, Rich. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're all well. Um, I think the first thing to say is uh, at International Workplace Group, uh, we're very proud of our partnership with E2E. Uh, it's, uh, it's about four or five years old now. And um, you know, we think that what we do, which is providing a, a network of on-demand workspace, is something that sort of goes hand in hand with the idea of a, a network, a vibrant and diverse network of entrepreneurs. Um, what I wanted to do is just say a, a, a few words about what, what it is we're trying to do um, and sort of how that fits into the, the world of business and the world of work. And then I'll talk a little bit also about some of the unique offers that we provide to E2E members. So International Workplace Group, we are a, a provider of flexible on-demand workspace. And I guess it, it, two years ago, we were responding to shifts in how people were working that were driven largely by technology and digitalization. The fact that mobile phones, smartphones, cloud computing meant that people were more mobile than ever before. And that was driving changes in, in terms of flexibility, uh, people working more uh, in, in a more flexible way. What we didn't expect was the impact of the last 12 to 18 months on how and where people work. And if you think about it, that the pandemic has had a dramatic effect on uh, the, the way that the office work gets done, the way that sort of knowledge work or white collar work, what, whatever you want to call it, will have shifted and changed forever. Uh, certainly an acceleration of that trend. So what, what are we doing to respond to that? Well, quite simply, in the future, people will work from anywhere and, and one of the trends that we see is people will work nearer to where they live uh, certainly there'll still be a role for company head offices and people gathering for certain types of activity to be creative and spontaneous but the idea of everybody herding into big offices in large cities like london uh, we, we think is something that is unlikely to return in the way that we all got used to uh, before the pandemic. We're building out a global network of on-demand workplaces at the moment, almost three and a half thousand locations in 120 countries across 1300 cities, um, all the way from uh, Hawaii to Nepal, Australia, Canada, Alaska, Russia, um, almost every part of the world where there's demand for workspace our network now touches and the idea is that it's convenient it's easy to access and you can use a smartphone uh, to pay as you go uh, simply book a, a desk in a location or a meeting room or an office uh, for however long you need it where you need it and uh, you know we're responding really to that shift in how we think work will get done uh, in the future. In the UK, we have 400 locations uh, in around uh, 95 towns and cities. 
When you're driving on the motorway network, on average, you're never more than 20 minutes away uh, from one of our locations. And we operate under a number of different brands, different formats in our UK network, including Base Point, Clubhouse, Spaces, Regis, uh, HQ, and Central Working, uh, all coming together to create a, a, a multi-format uh, network. All can be accessed on, on the smartphone. If you download the Regis app, uh, you, you can find a, a very simple way to locate a place from which to work and, uh, and away you go. And we do that under a number of different sort of membership products and services. With regard to our partnership uh, with E2E, we're, we're very proud to offer uh, E2E members, first of all, uh, for the next six months, free access to all of our business lounges in our network. You know, we want to really encourage people to get back into the groove, working from professional workspace uh, in, in high quality uh, locations uh, is something that people really benefit from, as well as working from home. Uh, so free access to our lounge network for the next six months. Also, we're offering 10% discount for any meeting room or conference room or training room uh, bookings across our network. And then finally, all E2E members can access uh, a, a private office product or a virtual office product with, the, with three months free as long as the, the minimum term commitment is six months or longer. So, so that's potentially up to a 50% uh, discount. Great way to introduce you to our network and, and to our products and services. Um, so thank you for listening. Uh, and also thank you to Shalini and the team for uh, the opportunity to, to partner with E2E. And I'll hand back now uh, to you, Shalini. Thank you very much, Richard. Really appreciate it. Well, through the partnership, we've become 24,000 members. And what I'd like to say, it's really nice to see I'm seeing uh, Truett Tate today. So it, I have to give him credit because without his support, I wouldn't have ended up in a company called LDC, Lloyd's TSB Development Capital, and I wouldn't have started this in 2011. He's in New Jersey. So we have from New Jersey to Colin and Jim uh, and Bill, who are in Seattle to Fashara, who's on my advisory board in Boston. And then we have people on the chat talking about Leeds, Richard, and, and also Geneva. So you have people from around the world. So we would say with IWG, uh, we would like to expand the partnership to international. And we're working closely with um, Billy Diana Abu, who's the global head of partnerships there. Um, so Richard, our challenge is, is to take this international now. Is that OK with you? Of course, yes, of course. I think we've got Durham as well on the uh, on the list. Uh, I, I'm from Durham, nearly, uh, or close to Durham originally, so uh, good to see people from that part of the world. Great, and we have the Shara from Boston. Does anybody else quickly want to shout out where they might be? I've heard Geneva, you're welcome to unmute and just tell us really quickly. I know we have um, my mom here from, and she's in um, Burton on Trent. So we'll see who else, anybody else want to quickly say? Aberdeen. Berlin. 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 Switzerland. Oxfordshire. Oxfordshire. Bristol. Bristol. Okay, so we've got a flavour. It's a lot from the UK. Edinburgh, I've got on the line here. So all international as well as national. So hopefully um, um, we will build the partnership with IWG. So I won't take up any more time now. I'd just like to introduce a, a good friend of mine. His name is Douglas Traffelet. He's the Chief Commercial Officer and uh, uh, of Deal Room, who is our partner. Uh, if you need data, we believe this is one of the best companies. He is the best company in the UK. I know PitchBook is available from Seattle. Deal Room is doing very well in terms of competition with PitchBook. Douglas, over to you to share some of your insights. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Shalini, uh, for having me. Uh, indeed, we are a data provider. We're uh, tracking 
uh, information around uh, startups and scale-ups uh, on a global basis with a real nice emphasis uh, here uh, in Europe. We've established very nice partnerships uh, with local governments as well uh, to get into trade registers and to help uh, investors uh, discover uh, new companies. Uh, and rather than simply being a lookup tool, uh, we're trying to find uh, the next uh, promising companies uh, uh, in our database and make them available uh, to investors and professional service advisors and, and other business development organizations. And I've been asked to this evening provide a bit of an overview on online marketplaces. Uh, clearly, Amazon is uh, the real pioneer in that space. And we've got some very good data over the last uh, several years on, on how this uh, category has exploded. Uh, and certainly with uh, COVID, uh, pre-COVID, certainly everything was moving online. Uh, and then a year ago, in the course of uh, perhaps uh, several weeks or a few months, uh, we had really a decade of change uh, take place uh, in that short period. Uh, initially, it used to be books, uh, as Amazon would know, uh, and electronics uh, that was sold online. And, and literally everything now can be purchased online. The key drivers uh, really have been convenience, speed, selection, uh, safety, and after sales service and support. And traditionally, online retail uh, has uh, been made up of e-commerce, but we also have uh, online marketplaces, on-demand services, uh, direct-to-consumer, uh, and uh, other models. Uh, and, and the share of retail uh, is really understated. Uh, and, and the online journey is, is really a, a part of, of every buyer. Uh, and online tra transactions really have become a default for most people. Uh, even when it comes to finding a spouse, I, I saw a study uh, out of Stanford that 40% of US couples now meet online, which is quite interesting. Uh, and I've got a slide deck. Uh, perhaps you guys could, could share that. Is that right? Or do you want me to do it? Yes, I, I'll share it. Thank you. Sarah. Now we can get into some of the hard numbers here to give a, a, a perspective on, on the magnitude of uh, online marketplaces. So if we look at the overall size of, of marketplace, and this is on a global basis, so what we're looking at is global venture capital investment into online marketplaces. And as you can see uh, in Q1 of this year, we had 28 billion US dollars invested. So a huge number uh, and a giant spike from what we had seen uh, in the previous six or so quarters. Next slide, please. Now, uh, one after this one. And uh, what we have here is a breakdown of where, uh, on a global basis, whether it's the US, China, or Europe, uh, the cash has uh, been invested. Uh, and we can see that China is really taking the lion's share of uh, investment over the last uh, four years. As a bit of an anomaly, though, in Europe, uh, had more investment uh, than China uh, in 2020. But you can see the magnitude of the markets uh, around the world. Next slide, please. And not surprisingly, uh, online marketplaces have produced a, a huge number of unicorns. We've tracked 371 unicorns uh, that have been produced. And of course, the unicorn uh, is a company that's uh, valued over 1 billion. Uh, in the US, it's been 140, China 82. And then the third tier is uh, the UK, Germany, and India, uh, each with uh, more than 20 uh, unicorns. And finally, if we want to look at, next slide, please. We want to look at what industries uh, the uh, marketplaces or, or what marketplaces by industry were that's attracting investments. Clearly, you see food. Uh, if we look all the way over to the right under 2021, food uh, taking the most amount of investment, uh, followed by transportation and fintech. Uh, and then following down from there, we've got real estate, home living, uh, sport, uh, sports, uh, fashion, and so on. So it's a huge market and a market that's only growing bigger and one that's uh, been accelerated by COVID. And, and we certainly think that with innovation and technology, Richard was speaking earlier about smartphones, uh, everyone having really a computer uh, in their pocket, uh, that online marketplaces are certainly here to stay and we'll see a lot more of them. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Doug. Uh, really, really appreciate you sharing that data. So if people want access to this sort of information, if you drop any of my team or I a line, we'll connect you to Deal Room. Um, their fees are not expensive and some of the research we can do on your behalf. So as members of premium members, um, one of the privileges is that we give you access uh, to Deal Room. And I didn't say earlier, in terms of our membership, our membership is complimentary and we have a premium membership, which is at £25 a month. Um, so if you take a, a look at our website, you will see some of the benefits, but it's around 20, 24,000 pounds of benefits. And sometimes you can even get access to people like Kanye King. Um, so Kanye is on the line. She founded um, the mobile organization. So I would say when people ask me, what is, what is different about E2E? I think the thing that makes us is the quality of the people within the community. We have the creme de la creme entrepreneurs who work with us who support, who send the lift down. And one of our missions is to turn knowledge into wisdom. And this is what Bill and Colin are really pushing through their, their coaching. And so we're really delighted to be able to do these sorts of things. So I'm just mentioning a few names. I hope you don't mind, there's so many friends here, but I want you to understand that our purpose is to try and connect everyone and be the match.com of business so that it, whoever you want to meet, at whatever time you want to meet them, we will make that connection for you, especially when we have an online platform. So this is the direction that we're going in. So, ladies and gentlemen, now without further uh, ado, I'm going to introduce Steve Medencia, Colin Breyer, and um, Bill Carr. So Steve, as I was saying earlier, um, I wanted to tell you that he's going to be co-hosting the discussion with me, and it was through Steve that I was originally introduced to the concept of the book, Working Backwards, and eventually meeting Colin and Bill this way. Steve, in himself, is an exceptional entrepreneur. He is the co-founder of one of London's most exciting startups called Fantastic Sports Technology Limited. When I first met Steve, um, which was prior to the pandemic, over a glass of wine, uh, he was very keen to demonstrate his new product, a sports consumer product to me, which was in beta mode, which is called Fantastic Swap. Swap, for those of you that don't know it, in this context is a blockchain NFT, and I will get him to explain to you what the NFT is, digital trading app for the sports sector. Um, the younger guys around E2E's office tell me it's like Panini or Topps meeting Red Bull. So I will get him <laughs> to explain that to you. Swap has supercharged the pandemic battered, uh, uh, um, battered um, sports fans uh, sector by delivering increased engagement and interaction for the international fans. Swap is now being used in over 185 countries worldwide. worldwide. Needless to say, I was usually impressed by Steve's demo uh, of the Swap product, despite having little knowledge of F NFT's digital collectible sector. I was even more impressed when Swap became the number one UK downloaded premium sports app. So congratulations, Steve, on, on that, pushing Man United to second position and Skybet to third. So I hope that makes more sense to you than me. But if I'm honest, Steve's product didn't really just click for me until the past few months when NFTs have become much more of the norm and digital collectibles uh, have been take, taking over as a super, supersonic rocket type of uh, uh, um, instrument. So NFTs literally are, are almost everywhere in the news currently, and I will let Steve explain that. So coming on to Colin, ladies and gentlemen, with Colin and Bill, it's now my huge pleasure to formally introduce both of them, Colin Breyer and Bill Carr. Colin started at Amazon in 1998 and Bill joined a year later. Um, the time, their time at Amazon was uh, covered a period of unmatched innovation brought, uh, and the, uh, that brought products and services, including Kindle, I'm sure many of you have a Kindle, Amazon Prime, guys, I live on Amazon Prime as my, uh, as my uh, relaxation. Amazon Echo, there is one in every room of my house. And Alexa, uh, and Amazon Web Services to Life. So this is the two gentlemen uh, uh, who are here uh, behind this. Colin spent 12 years at Amazon, uh, and then two years he was, in that time, chief of staff to Jeff Bezos a.k.a. Jeff's to Shadow, working closely each day with the prolific founder. After leaving Amazon in 2010, Colin moved to Singapore and served as an advisor to Carousel and was the chief operating officer at Redmart, an online gro um, grocery delivery service which has subsequently been sold to Alibaba. 
So Colin, huge congratulations on all of that. Um, Bill spent 15 years at Amazon uh, as vice president of digital media. He built and oversaw a team of more than a thousand employees, including engineering, product marketing, business development, content acquisition, design, and TV and movie development teams at Amazon Studios. Under Bill's leadership, Amazon Digital Media grew to a global operation exceeding $1 billion in revenue, $1 billion in revenue, as the company pushed to, complete, uh, to compete with Apple, Netflix, and Hulu. Uh, Bill left Amazon in 2013. He became an entrepreneur in residence at Mavon LLC, an early stage consumer-only venture capital firm. He then served as the chief operating officer of OfferUp, the largest mobile marketplace for local buyers and sellers in the US where he worked to improve operations and their user experience. Through their wealth of experience and through their unprecedented access to the Amazon way, it was refined, articulated and proven to be repeatable, scalable and adaptable. Their book, Working Backwards, shows how success is not achieved by the genius of a single leader but through the commitment to and the execution of a well-defined, rigorously executed principles. So gentlemen, I would like to say thank you so much for taking the time to um, share your secrets with us and to share your stories with us. And I'm gonna hand over to Steve um, to begin our conversation with Bill and Colin. Steve, over to you, thank you. That's great, Shalini, thank you very much. And everybody's here to listen to Bill and Colin, so I'm gonna make this exceedingly brief. Um, just to dispel two quick rumors about working backwards, the book. Uh, it, first of all, if you have read it, you will quickly realize this is not about Bill and Colin. This is about the practices of them and their peers all established and made so successful to make such a, a wonderful, tremendous, sexual, successful enterprises throughout the world. Second, um, working backwards isn't just for big companies. If you haven't read the book, I can assure you that this is absolutely true. Um, how did I become an evangelist of, of working backwards? I read Bill and Colin's book. Uh, it was right at the start of the NFT uprise. I felt that our company needed more clarity, more uh, defining our objectives. We ultimately had more success because we followed a lot of the practices that Bill and Colin had established and created within the book. So it really truly is probably one of the best investments you can make if you haven't made it already to help give your enterprise, regardless of the size, um, that clarity that it needs, that kind of focus that it requires. And so, you know, when you're a roller coaster of a startup, you know, if you can make that kind of investment, that's easy, go for it straight away. That'd be my strongest recommendation tonight. But I really wanna now turn it over to Bill and to Colin so they can give an overview of the insights, stories, and all of those secrets from inside Amazon. So Bill and Colin, over to you for the E2E -E exchange audience. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Bill, would you like to kick off? Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Shalini and Steve. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here so that you all can see my slides. Thank you. Whoops. That's not what I want to show you. There we go. Okay. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Shalini and Steve, for giving Colin and I this opportunity. Um, so I won't reintroduce uh, myself, uh, given the uh, generous introduction that uh, I've already received. Uh, so let me just jump right in. Um, so I was an entrepreneur in residence at a venture capital firm named Mavron back in 2017. And I was actually, I was at a, um, an offsite for the company along with the portfolio CEOs, as well as uh, one uh, quite prominent uh, Fortune 50 CEO who will go unnamed for the sake of this conversation. But um, in this, uh, in a breakout session with about uh, 30 portfolio CEOs and this, and this well-known uh, CEO, uh, the topic of Amazon came up and the well-known CEO said, Amazon, I don't understand. How does Amazon do it? How have, they been able, how have they been able to be so successful in such diverse businesses as cloud computing, digital media, devices, e-commerce, logistics? We're still trying to get our core business right. And I was really struck by this statement and this question. And I was struck for a number of reasons. Number one, 
Um, I was struck because uh, uh, this CEO is, uh, has been quite successful over time. And I relayed this conversation to, to Colin a few days later, and we realized a few things when we, when we talked about it. Number one, we realized that this question comes up all the time, whether it's a prominent CEO or it's in the press or early stage people, uh, uh, leaders or people at the beginning of their career. They always are trying to figure out, how do I understand Amazon's singular success? Uh, the second thing we realized is there really is no authoritative or accurate source of information to answer this question. Uh, then we also realized that based on our specific experience, Colin and I were in the right places at the right time where we were in the room uh, and in the process when the company developed uh, many of its biggest and most successful products, as well as what we're going to share with you, the processes that they developed to actually enable them to do so. And um, the final thing we realized is that we did develop, uh, if we did share this information. Hi, it sounds like someone needs to go on mute, please. Yeah, thank you. Could someone please go on mute? Everyone, please go on mute. Thank you. So uh, we also realized that companies of all shapes and sizes would benefit by understanding uh, the what Amazon developed and why it's helped to make them so successful. So we endeavored uh, uh, to write this book, uh, Working Backwards. And really the goal of the book was to help the next generation of business leaders to uh, uh, be able to be more successful and look around the corners and get over the hurdles that Amazon had to get over. All right. So, uh, you know, uh, first of all, thanks for having us and uh, we'll, we'll get through our material and then op really want to open it up to Q&A to give folks a chance to answer uh, questions. Uh, and so here just a, here's a smattering of Amazon's uh, very uh, large and diverse uh, product portfolio. And, uh, you know, sounds like Shalini, you're a big customer of or user of a, a lot of these already, and as are a lot of people in the audience, and they're very different businesses. But what we're going to focus on today is what is the one thing that all of these businesses have in common? And it's that they were built with this new way of, of, of operating and, and organizing a business, and it's, it's called the invention machine. And this was a term that was coined by Jeff Bezos uh, when he had to encapsulate really to answer the question, how does Amazon do it or how does Amazon work? And so that's really what this, th this book is about is to talk about the invention machine and then how you can use some of these principles and processes in your own organization. So you can think of the invention machine as a set of uh, guiding principles, the Amazon leadership principles, uh, and then also five processes that every organization does, no matter how big or small you are. You have to hire, you have to organize and communicate, um, develop new products, and then how do you measure things? And the good news is, uh, Steve mentioned, is that these principles and processes can be applied across a wide number of industries and also um, small organizations of five people all the way up to, you know, Amazon uses these and the last count they have about 1.3 million employees. So these, they ha has a wonderful fractal, fractal quality that works for small and large organizations uh, um, alike. And so uh, let's just dive in and we're gonna touch on each of these and then we'll open it up to Q and A. So the, the first thing that I wanna talk about are the Amazon leadership principles. And you'll, uh, we're not gonna go into all 14 of them, but I wanted to mention a couple of notable things about the Amazon leadership principles. First of all, they're 14, which is more so than, than most uh, companies have. They can go under the name of core, core, um, core values, leadership principles, you know, uh, uh, what have you, but they're all, they're all really the same thing. And so you can think of what Amazon's leadership principles are they're really, it's, a, it's an actionable framework for how you can make decisions when you don't have all the information you need, you're moving fast, and the senior executives aren't in the room. That's really why the leadership principles were, were created. And then there's uh, also, there's a saying at Amazon called good intentions don't work, mechanisms do. So while you can read and understand these leadership principles, you also need reinforcing mechanisms or processes to make sure that these leadership principles are followed day in and day out. And so another unique thing that Amazon has done, and the reason why they can have 14 instead of just five, you know, three or four or five leadership principles, is Amazon has really stitched and woven each of these principles into the major building blocks or processes of, of the company. And you'll see some of these leadership principles shine as we uh, go into more detail 
on, on some of these processes. And so those are um, two reasons why that the Amazon leadership principles, they're more than just posters on the wall. They are, it's just this actionable framework and they become part of your DNA, whether you like it or not, if you're at Amazon for any reasonable amount of time. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna jump into the first process and Bill's gonna take you through that one. So the first process we wanna talk about is how Amazon conducts uh, hiring. And um, there are a few notable things. It's called the bar raiser hiring process. And there are a few notable things about this process. Um, this is uh, uh, Amazon's scalable, repeatable method for, to enable the company to consistently make the appropriate and successful hiring decisions for the company. So the first thing that's notable is that this process has specific criteria and data that interviewers are assigned to collect. So in a typical interview process, it is often left up to the, the each interviewer to ask whatever questions suit them. Uh, which actually uh, then creates substantial biases in the interview process. Uh, one of the ways to create an unbiased process is to create objective data. And in the case for Amazon, the objective data are the 14 leadership principles. So in a typical Amazon interview loop, there are six or seven interviewers, which means that each interviewer has either is assigned either two or three leadership principles and uh, for the whole of their interview, their job is simply to ask behavioral based questions to find out whether this candidate um, will meet the bar or exceed the bar for the two or three leadership principles that they've been assigned. Uh, another notable aspect is that each interviewer is required to carefully document their interview in writing to write an assessment to submit that assessment and to do all of that. Uh, without comparing notes or, or creating any kind of confirmation bias by discussing the candidate in any way, shape or form until they've completed their assessment and their vote. Once they've done so, the next notable uh, element is that there's, there's almost always a, an in-person debrief meeting. And in that debrief meeting, everyone reads uh, the notes from all interviewers, which then gives the interview panel a complete picture of the candidate, not just two or three principles, but all 14. And then finally, there is someone who is called a bar raiser. This person is a subject matter expert in the hiring process and interviewing process. And they are participated in every interview loop and they lead that debrief meeting. And uh, they uh, help facilitate a conversation to enable the group and enable the hiring manager to make the best possible hiring decision. Technically, that person also has a veto power over the hiring manager to ensure that they don't, they don't succumb to urgency bias and that they raise the bar with every hire. Like all processes, it's, uh, it's, um, it's easy to teach. Uh, it doesn't require scarce resources. It has a feedback loop. The more you use it, the better you get it, uh, the better it gets. And so uh, this is one of, uh, one of the successful programs that Amazon has developed. The next thing I wanna talk about is how the company organizes uh, uh, teams. And this was a specific solution to a specific problem. In the early 2000s, as the company was growing rapidly and becoming more complex, a business that went far beyond uh, books, music, and video, and expanded into multiple product categories, multiple countries, multiple geographies, uh, it became increasingly complex to uh, develop a product roadmap to cut across the company. And initially, we took an approach that is the conventional approach, which is that we uh, increased our communication, created formal processes for collaboration, communication, and planning across groups. And we did that for about a year. Uh, but after a year, we rejected that approach because we decided that we were spending more time planning and discussing and debating work rather than doing work and building on behalf of customers. So in fact, we took a counterintuitive approach, which was that we went in the other direction and said, how do we organize so that our teams have to do as little collaboration and as little coordination and planning as possible because that's not value add work. The value add work is when you build new products and features on behalf of customers. And so our solution, which evolved over time, is called uh, the solution that Amazon developed over time is called uh, separable single threaded teams. And so the concept is very simple that each team has uh, a clear owner. The owner is cross-functional. That team could include technical and business resources. That team uh, has almost all the resources they need 
to address the specific part of the, the technical stack or the business problem they own solving for the company and that they operate in a, in a highly autonomous way relative to other teams in the country co company. And uh, to quote Dave Limp, who's the senior vice president of the device business at Amazon, the best way to fail at inventing something is by making it somebody's part-time job. And this org structure is the antidote to that because in each case, for an important initiative, product, PL, or business, the, the company appoints a, a leader who is single threaded focused and separate from other teams so that they can actually go and invent the future for the, that product or uh, uh, that category. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is how Amazon uh, uses, uses communication and also makes decisions with, with groups. And uh, you know, as Bill mentioned earlier, and you'll start to see a theme with some of these processes, they are, um, the processes were created to solve very specific problems that Amazon was facing as a growing organization. And often that the, the processes that Amazon created were counterintuitive to what was uh, standard industry practice. And the, the communication is, is, is no exception to this. And uh, you know, up until 2004, an Amazon decision-making meeting would work just the way uh, most other organizations would. Someone would get up in front of the room and start walking through a, a slide deck, you know, uh, talking about an issue. And then uh, if they weren't uh, interrupted with, during the presentation, you know, answer questions and have a discussion around the topic at hand. And at Amazon, um, we were doing the same thing too. And there was a four hour uh, management meeting with uh, Jeff Bezos and his direct reports the, the, called the S team. And uh, this is when I was working with Jeff as his technical advisor. And the, the teams coming and presenting to us, the, the issues were getting more complex. We needed to, to move faster. The stakes were getting higher, just that you know, the amount of an impact was, was getting greater. And we realized that things were not going well. And so, Jeff just uh, um, one day said, we're gonna switch the way we're running this meeting. Um, and now I'm gonna require any group to come in to the S team needs to come in with a written memo, which is an Amazon narrative, another word for an Amazon narrative to, to, to present their ideas. And it was an unpopular decision at the time. Um, another notable thing, it was a reversible decision. You know, we were gonna try this, we, ex we would experiment with it. If it didn't work, we could always go back to what everyone else was doing, which would be using slides, but we didn't. And uh, several years later, uh, Jeff Bezos, he, he called this one of the most important moves or the best moves that Amazon has ever made, which is switching to, to narratives um, to present an issue. And um, the reason why Amazon uses narratives over a uh, traditional slide deck is uh, there, there are several reasons. One is it really forces the writer or the writing team, because it's often more than one person who authors these uh, six page memos to, um, to really uh, synthesize their thought process, put it in, in, in paper and have this story arc before they can go and present it to the, the, the rest of the audience. And so that just makes it a, a, a much richer and well thought through idea before they get up in, in front of the audience. And the, the second thing it does is it removes a lot of bias. And uh, one example of bias with a typical slide presentation is called pre you know, presentation bias. You can have a charismatic speaker who uh, can, um, can maybe convince a group for, to do a so-so idea or even a bad idea that the, you know, the company shouldn't, shouldn't do. And then the flip side is you could have someone who's not a very good presenter who has a great idea, but you're just thinking, when is this presentation gonna end? It, you know, it, it, it's so boring. So what narratives do is they elevate the idea versus the presentation. And you know, at the end of the day, customers really care about does the company, has the company made the right decision to build a, a product or make a decision that makes my life better as a customer? They don't really care if the presentation was engaging or boring. Um, the, another reason why narratives shine over uh, typical slides is just simply pixel density. So you look at the pixel density, you can fit about seven to nine times as much uh, information in a narrative versus a slide deck. Uh, also, people read faster, you know, two to three times faster than they talk, so you can get through a lot more information. The other thing that uh, narratives allow you to do is, is study and analyze these multi-causal complex uh, arguments, which is really what faces all of our organizations and business, versus the strict hierarchical uh, format that slides typically require you to do. 
And so what all this has done is, is it really allows leaders to get um, connected at a much deeper level with the same unit of invest time unit of investment. So an hour spending um, in a narrative meeting where you get you know 10 to 20 times as much information is the same as an hour spent in a slide uh, 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 setting. And so typically what happens if you use narratives over slides for this decision-making purpose, you're gonna exit the meeting with higher quality decisions than if you used a slide. Uh, the, the, the next process that uh, we're, we're gonna talk about is called uh, the working backwards process. And uh, Bill, if you could just uh, jump to the next slide. I will um, as soon as it responds, it's not. Responding. Okay, um, it's not a very exciting slide. It's just a couple words on there. So I'll start anyway. But um, so the working backwards, uh, it, it's the name of our book, but it's also the name of very specific process at Amazon. And it's the, the, the process that Amazon uses to take an idea and to vet it, to decide whether it's worth bringing to market, you know, building a, a service or a product or a feature. And Amazon uses the working backwards process for um, small ideas, you know, for like a feature in, in, in the phone app or anywhere up to a large ideas like or a large new business that they should enter a new geography or a new line of business. Um, so this is another one of these processes that has a nice fractal, fractal quality. And if, if you have to remember one thing about the working backwards process, it's really starting with the desired customer experience and then working backwards from that. Sounds easy, sounds obvious, but it's actually quite different from how a lot of organizations typically make decisions. A lot of organizations use what's called a skills forward approach. They ask questions like, what are we good at? What are our core competencies? What are our competitors doing? Can we nudge into an adjacent market? You know, how quickly can we get there? Uh, you know, SWOT analysis is a typical tool that people use. You know, what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? But at Amazon, we were using that too. And, and we noticed that we weren't mentioning the word customer enough. And so we threw all that uh, aside and said, we are going to experiment. And, and, and this uh, eventually stuck at Amazon and turned out to be another defining hallmark process of Amazon. We we're gonna pivot and just focus on the customer and make sure that the customer was front and center from the very beginning of this journey. And so how Amazon does this, the, the primary tool Amazon uses is that it's a document, a written document called the PRFAQ, which is short for press release and frequently asked questions. And so the first thing a person or a group does when they have an idea is they write a one page press release. And uh, which, which is usually the last thing that organizations write before a product launches. But at Amazon, what you have to do is you have to write that one page press release where you have to clearly define what is the customer problem I'm trying to solve and then two, you have to say, what is our solution to that customer problem? And then three is, you know, so why, why should the customer care and, and, and why should they want to use this uh, product or feature? And so if, once you read this press release, if you don't want to jump out and go buy the, the product or use this feature, you go back and you rewrite the press release again. So the working backwards is an iterative process. And after you're satisfied that you've got a great idea and you know, with the press release, you're, you know, the, the team is excited, yes, this is worth building. The next thing you do is you work on the FAQ document. And the FAQ document is usually broken out into two parts, an ex external FAQ and an internal FAQ. And so an external FAQ are the sets of questions and answers that, you, that customers or the press would typically ask about the product or service. How much is it gonna cost me? Um, why is this service, uh, why should I use this service versus what's out there on the market today? Why should I change my behavior and how is it going to make my life better? So you uh, ask and answer all of those uh, tough questions up front. The internal FAQ you can think of as what are all of the tough issues that we need to ask and answer so in order for us to organize and bring this idea to market. And you know, some examples of that would be, can we build this product with a bill of materials of less than $150 with these set, this set of required features? What are the privacy or data sharing implica implications of this uh, product or service? How are we gonna bring it to market through what type of sales channel are, are we gonna do that? Are there any skills that we need to acquire or develop internally in order to bring this product to market? And this is another iterative process. You write your um, PRFAQ document, 
And then if you're missing a key question or you haven't quite gotten it right, you go back and you iterate until you're, you're, you know what you're, you're satisfied, you know what you're getting into, you know what the tough problems that you need to solve moving forward are. And only then will that project get greenlit at Amazon. And so that's really um, all, all of what the working backwards process is, is about is really to ensure you have a crisp customer problem and you know how to solve it before you allocate resources to that. So given that um, we're tight on time, I'm going to be quick with this last section, which is metrics. So um, Amazon focuses on input metrics, not output metrics. And many people who join the company are very surprised by the, the lack of time that are spent debating and discussing output metrics like revenue, free cash flow, gross margin. And uh, instead, uh, the company obsesses over uh, controllable customer facing inputs. So what is a controllable customer facing input? So a simple example is the retail business, doesn't matter whether it's offline or online, those controllable metrics for the business are, what's the selection? So in your store, what items are you offering? Number two, what's the price of those offerings and how, do the, how does that price compare to comp competition? And what are the details of the customer experience? How convenient is it to access this store? Is there convenient parking? Is it easy to find the items that I want in the store? Is checkout quick? In the case of online, how quick does it take from the time that I click to it's delivered at my doorstep? And so uh, Amazon figured out long ago that if you actually spend your time peeling back the layers of the onion of the different inputs and creating a series of incredibly detailed metrics that funnel up into each one of them, and by driving initiatives relentlessly to improve those input metrics, that this will over time actually yield the right outputs and will also keep you focused on the customer. Um, and one of the mechanisms the company uses to do this is called S-Team Goals. Uh, so each year, the S-Team is the leadership team reporting to Jeff Bezos, and that team identifies from the annual operating plan several hundred goals uh, that they will focus on for the year. For example, a decade ago in 2010, they had 452 detailed S-Team Goals. And of those goals, uh, believe it or not, the words uh, revenue, uh, free cash flow, uh, were only mentioned a total of four times. And words like net income, gross profit, gross margin operating profit were, were not mentioned at all. So 360 of those 452 goals would have a direct impact on the customer experience. So uh, Amazon figured out that by focusing on their inputs rather than their outputs, this is the way they actually achieve long-term success for customers and financial success. Um, and tip of the hat to uh, Jim Collins. This is uh, uh, the way that Amazon visualized their inputs over time. And uh, if you haven't read Good to Great, uh, it is the second best business book ever written. So I strongly recommend that you go out and buy that uh, for those that couldn't detect my tongue in cheek there. Hopefully you <laughs> yeah, the best one is obviously yours, right? <laughs> yes. So to wrap up, uh, these, uh, these five uh, scalable, repeatable processes combined with the leadership principles, these things comprise the Amazon Invention Machine. And uh, we hope you enjoyed our talk today. If you want any more information, you can visit our website. And uh, we look forward to jumping into the Q&A portion. Bill, Colin, thank you very much. I think we got thousands of pounds of insight there. Uh, or, or, or maybe hundreds of thousands of pounds of insight in a very short period of time. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Steve. I think Steve's going to kick off with the first question. What I wanted to say is everybody, please do use the uh, raise your hands to ask questions and then uh, please go live with your questions. We want to make it interactive. But uh, Steve, over to you. And we're going to do a poll in just a couple of minutes as well. It's a very short poll. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to Steve for the first question. Great, thanks, Shalini, and, and Bill and Colin, thank you very much for that very excellent overview. Um, the first question that kind of comes to my mind is more big picture. And, you know, when you see the six pagers, the no PowerPoint rule, the 14 core leadership principles, the mechanisms to make all of that work, to reinforce those things, it, and the different iterations you had to go through as a senior executive and stuff, was there a point in time when you stopped and you said, you know, Eureka, we have figured out a great formula here. Or did it take time post your Amazon career for you to kind of reflect backward a bit and to say, 
You know, what we had there as far as operating principles was very special and is applicable in a whole bunch of different places. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in with that one. I mean, I, I would say that um, there, there are very few eureka moments. Um, and actually going back to that prior slide with Jim Collins and the flywheel, the whole principle that actually is described in that book is that great companies are not built with like, with like singular moments or eureka moments. They're built by continuous and constant uh, uh, effort to, to focus on key input metrics and slowly but surely spin the flywheel faster and faster. So progress at Amazon never felt like this. It always just felt like a steady up into the right process. That said, I can say that by the later years of my tenure and based on all the time I spent interacting with external companies, I was certainly aware that um, we had processes and practices that were uh, incredibly distinctive from other companies. And I was also painfully uh, aware of this in my last years as I brought in senior executives to join my organization. And for them, the process of changing from a mode and methods that were successful for them over multiple decades to methods that were in many cases counterintuitive or completely counter to the way that they worked at other companies uh, required quite a transition. Uh, and then finally, I would say that in my post Amazon career, yes, by uh, uh, stepping into the venture capital world and seeing a lot of early stage companies, it was apparent to me very, very quickly that uh, the solutions that Amazon had built would be uh, incredibly useful and practical to companies at uh, almost any growth stage. Thank you very much for that, Bill. Um, may I ask you a cheeky question and then we're going to go on to the poll and then I'm going to go on to the interactive Q&A. How did Jeff feel about you kind of sharing your sort of the secrets of Amazon or the insights and your learning? Did he have a view? Did he mind? Or was he, was he supportive? Well, when uh, we decided to write the book, um, we, you know, we obviously thought, well, what, what is Jeff going to think? It was a little premature just to tell him about the idea until we had actually had more idea of what the book would be about. So we wrote, um, we actually wrote a PRFAQ document about the, the book itself. Uh -huh. And uh, and then we wrote a, a sample chapter. We uh, put together a sample chapter and then sent an email off to Jeff saying, hey, we're thinking about writing a business book about Amazon. Here's what it's about. Um, here's a sample chapter. What do you think? Had no idea whether we'd get a cease and desist letter back or, or anything in between. And he wrote back relatively quickly and said, uh, if it's done right, I'd love to see a book that's uh, out there on, on this topic. And I can't think of any two people better positioned to do it than, than the two of you. So the, the, the done right, um, when, when Jeff says that, um, he's got incredibly high standards. So that really, you know, upped, upped the game and, and, you know, put the, the pressure and onus on us to really make sure that we um, were accurately codified what it is uh, to you know, to encapsulate how does Amazon work. So it really motivated us to make sure we got the story right. And uh, you know, Jeff he, he was supportive throughout the the whole process. You know, it was a, an endeavor, Bill and Bill and our endeavor outside of Amazon to be clear. But um, yeah, Jeff knew about it from uh, the very beginning of the project and has been supportive since. Oh, brilliant. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you very much, Colin. I really appreciate that. I'm going to go over to Brad Aspas in a second, but I was wondering, Sophie, if you wouldn't mind to um, um, put up the, the, the poll quickly. Uh, and then, Steve, I think you've got more questions, so we will in interject between yourselves and um, the audience. So the first one is, in a post-pandemic world, which of the following best describes your choice of work location? Uh, just pick one of the four. Um, then what would you benefit from? And please, if it's none of the above, send me an email to say what you would benefit from. We're trying to evolve E2E on a daily basis and bring out new services, maybe follow the Amazonian strategy one day. Um, number three, what aspects of E2E's new premium memberships? I mentioned that at about £25 a month. Um, um, do you find offers that the best value? What would you need most of? And the last question is, if you need access to... Uh, the IWG packages, it's either yes or no, and we would be happy to connect you. So I will let that run in the background for you to answer them. I would really encourage everyone, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we've got about 
150 people, I think, on the call. So uh, I'd really appreciate if everyone just took a second. It's only four questions to complete that. And I'm going to go over to Brad, um, followed by um, um, somebody who is called um, Zoom user. I can't see your name, but you have your hand up. Um, so let me let me ask Brad to ask his question, if I may. Hi, Colin and Bill. Thanks very much for, um, for your presentation. Very, very impressive. Uh, Amazon started off in physical media a long time ago when you were both there. Uh, they've moved on greatly since then. Do you think they still want to be in physical media in the future? Uh, or do they want to be a retailer, in fact? Or is that just a very low value part uh, of their proposition going forward? Thank you, Greg. Yeah, well, I don't quite understand. I don't quite understand the second half of your question, which by by being in physical media, that does make them a retailer. So I don't quite understand the the trade off choice you're asking there. Uh, so so the uh, the trade off is that going forward, do they need the sheds that they're building around the world, or will they have seller fulfilled prime take over so they don't need the sheds? Oh. So they'll still be a retailer, but just not oh. doing it themselves. Well, seller fulfilled prime is is actually one of the core parts of their business. And if you're not aware of it, the, the program that they have called fulfillment by Amazon is actually one of the five largest businesses in the company. And that in that business, uh, you know, uh, Amazon's marketplace sellers uh, send their inventory into Amazon's fulfillment centers and Amazon manages that inventory and handles picking, packing and shipping that those items out to customers, which uh, serves a couple of benefits. One is by doing so, those items are actually eligible for to be part of Amazon Prime, meaning they'll they'll be eligible for either two or one day delivery, depending on the delivery speed offered by the customer, because Amazon can then control the delivery speed. And two, they can the sellers get to take advantage of the scale uh, of Amazon's network, where no individual seller could you know possibly meet the the scale that Amazon has achieved in their fulfillment center network. So. Amazon's cost to deliver a package is, uh, you know, to pick, pack, and ship uh, and deliver to a customer is certainly much lower than any individual seller. So, no, being a physical retailer is is it was you know the starting point for the business uh, was core then and is core now. So I I do not see any I cannot I can foresee a lot of things, but I can never foresee a day when Amazon is not a is not a retailer of physical goods. The only other thing I would add is just uh, abstracting it a level is Amazon doesn't really start with what do we want to be? What type of company or product do, do we want to give to customers? They start by asking uh, what, how can we organize to solve real customer problems? And when you go down that journey by letting the customer needs dictate um, how you organize, what you build, what competencies you need to get if you don't have them already. Sometimes you don't know where that path is going to end up, but how Amazon would approach you know, a, a, a place like that, the, the, that question is by starting with what are the customer needs and how do we organize to solve it? I agree with Bill about the, the, the retail business, but also um, it's just that would be a, a, a question about Amazon. Someone would just say, well, what does the customer think about this? Because that's more important than what we, what we want. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. And what you should know, Colin, um, about Brad is he's uh, won the Queen's Award for exports. He exports to over 150 countries. Um, so, uh, really good questions. And, and it, what, what I noticed in the press, I think it was yesterday, is that Amazon started hairdressing salons in London. So they've got the state of the art hairdressing salons, which I was shocked by. I never realized that they'd go into that. So that was very interesting. I'm going to come over, if I may, to uh, Demetrius Hastas. Demetrius, great to see you. Demetrius is an investor in E2E and he's also sitting on our advisory board. Demetrius, thanks for joining us. Thank you all and nice to <clears throat> see everybody and thank you for your excellent presentation, guys. Uh, a cheeky question. Wonderful processes, but most businesses have some failures. I mean, there are famous ones that sort of Diet Coke or the Light Coke versus Pepsi. Uh, were there any that you uh, or Amazon experienced? And if so, how were they handled and what did you learn from them? There are a lot of a lot of failures, and if you want to if you want to be an inventive company, you have to be prepared to fail. You know, Jeff has a quote: "It's not an experiment if you already know it's going to work." 
Um, so if you're gonna do an experiment, some of them have to fail. You know, we talk about the Fire Phone, which is uh, one of Amazon's largest failures to date. These processes aren't designed to, to um, turn out a perfect hit every time. They're designed to allow a company to move fast and try to solve real world problems with as high a success rate as possible. Because you only need a few big winners like AWS, uh, Kindle, Alexa to pay for a, a lot of failures. And uh, you know there there have been uh, failures. You know there are a lot of products that never made the the light of day or that that were launched and and we pulled back. There are two types of failures. One is you know something like a Fire Phone where you try you build a, a product and it goes to market and it just didn't take off. You look at well, what what assumptions did we make that that um, just turned out to be not not to be true, and can we avoid that uh, type of mistake in the future? Then there's a, a different class of failures, but which are execution failures. You know, if if part of the website or service goes down, Amazon has a process to handle those failures, and one of the things is a really clinical correction of errors report. And what you do there is you um, really do a deep dive and ask that, you know, borrow from Toyota, the five whys, why this problem happened, why, what the defect was, and what processes or mechanisms can we put in place to make it happen. And then you shout as loud and as broad about the failure as possible so other people don't make the same mistake. Making a mistake is, is okay, um, but how you handle the failure, I think, even is even more important and a determining factor of the success of an organization or company. Thank you. Sorry, Demetrius, did that answer your question? Yes, absolutely, and thank you very much for, I thought that would be the case, and that's exactly the point, you know, I was very pleased to hear that you didn't suggest that these processes were designed to eliminate errors because that's impossible. It's just the feedback loop that's important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Demetrius. So um, there's quite a few people who are asking questions. I'm just going to shout their names so you can get ready. Um, so I think we will have Ben Narison next. Uh, we have Mark Mitchell. We have Gemma, um, Gemma Coles. Uh, we have Daniel Truman and we have Mithesh uh, Vikaria and Steve, sorry, I'm taking away all your thunder, so I will give it back to you in a, in a few minutes. So, um, Ben, um, over to you to ask your question, please. Hi, Ben. Hi, thanks so much. I put this in the chat as well. I was just wondering with the, with the narrative format where you're writing up everything in advance, which I think is great as a writer, um, is that distributed in advance of the meeting to give people time to review it or... Um, is it done live in meeting? Uh, I, I can see advantages to both. And I wonder if, in fact, both were tried and what your learnings were from it. I'll jump in so, really quickly. It's the latter. Um, there's some unknown law of physics where people will update their document up until the very minute the meeting starts. It takes 20 minutes to read a six pager. So at Amazon, we just found out it was most efficient to set aside the first 20 minutes of a meeting to read the paper, to read the narrative. Um, so you're not reading an older version or one that's recently been updated because you want to make it more efficient for everyone. We tried both, but it, it's, it works more efficiently just to start off the meeting by reading. I would add that there's awesome. a second factor for why this is done because organizations fool themselves when they distribute things in advance um, and then ask at the beginning of the meeting, has everyone read it? No one is gonna raise their hand and say they didn't read it, but the reality is there's no way everybody read that document or the slide deck you sent out in advance. And so I've seen this happen. I see, I see this happen all the time in my advisory work where companies, um, or, they, or they hand out something in the meeting that is 20 pages long and allow people five minutes to read it and say, okay, we're ready to have a discussion. So it's very important that you recognize uh, realities of human behavior. N you'll never have 100% of the people read something in advance. So if you, if you take that path, you are deluding yourself and everyone in the meeting that you actually think you're gonna have a meaningful discussion because not everyone will have read it. Or B, the other delusion is you pass out something that, can, that would take more than an hour to read and allow people to read it for five minutes. So, uh, have a delusion proof system, pass out something that requires less than 20 minutes for a one hour meeting. It has to be less, six pages or fewer. So you have, so you can read it in 20 minutes or less for a 30 minute meeting it has to be three pages or fewer. And this way you avoid delusion 
and you actually everyone will then have the exact same information and you have a high quality discussion for the remaining part of the meeting. So the length of the write up is gated by the length of the meeting. A 30 minute Correct. meeting you cannot give them more than three pages and an Correct. hour meeting you can't give more than six and you always carve off that time in the beginning to read. Okay, great, right. thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Ben, great question and Bill, very concise response, a, a, a big learning from, from my perspective. Um, thank you very much. I'm gonna move over to Mark Mitchell. Mark, great to see you. Would you introduce Hi. yourself and uh, ask a question? Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd see uh, Mr. Bezos as an um, extremely successful man, obviously, and uh, it appears now that he's uh, conciliatory in um, his operating methods. Is he really that fair with his management team, or would he just be a ruthless operator, um, or would, are these um, systems really in operation? Well, I'm not... I'm not quite sure I understand the question. There's, there's, you, you're, at, you're coming to it from a premise that I'm not quite clear what your premise is, but if, if you're asking, um, does, does Jeff Bezos, did he help develop these processes that we described in the book? Yes, he was instrumental in leading and developing them. And, and, and the reason he did so is out of his both um, self-interest and recognition that uh, he went through the transition that every entrepreneur CEO does go through, and some go through this transition successfully and some do not, which is that the methods that you use to start a company and run a company effectively when you have 100 or fewer people don't work once you get over 120 people, don't work once you're growing, doubling, tripling year over year, don't work once you get over $100 million, et cetera, et cetera. And so what Jeff devised were a set of principles that would A, be a proxy for him when he's not in the room, and B, would be a proxy to define what does a, what does a role model leader do? How do they behave at Amazon? In other words, it's a proxy for him. And then he set up a series of processes to reinforce this effectively proxy for him. So this is really what we describe in the book. Um, if, and if you're asking, so how does Jeff Bezos lead? This will sound like the corniest answer ever, but simply simply go Google Amazon leadership principles and read all 14 of them and read them extremely carefully. And you will learn things like, uh, uh, for example, that um, leaders at Amazon uh, insist on high standards. They have relentlessly high standards. Many people will think these standards unreasonably high uh, as a simple example, and there's more to it. but. If you've ever worked for someone who sets incredibly high standards and where they insist on a standard and you think, wow, I have no idea how my team or I could possibly ever meet that standard, then that's one example of the way that Jeff Bezos and other successful leaders at Amazon lead. Thank okay. you, Bill. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, did you want to ask anything further, Mark? Yeah, or... yeah I have a Yeah, I my, have a my partner has a supplementary sure. question. Yeah, that'd be great. So I, I noticed in, in one of the leadership principles was um, about being frugal. And, and then you talked about the, um, the way in which decisions are made backwards. Um, so around, around investment, if, for example, um, a new idea is, is submitted and everybody goes, yes, that's great. Let's move forward with this. Um, how robust is the dis discussion about what sort of investment is going to be made into into the particular idea that's been that's tabled? Like deadlines and all those things. That that is part of the internal FAQ is you know what is the level of investment that's going to be required to build this from the organization? What's the total addressable market? So you 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 want to uh, focus on things that have a big a total addressable market or solve a very large customer problem. And then you wanna know uh, as best as possible um, what you're getting into or what are the, the milestones or check-in milestones in order for the next no go or no go decision uh, to make. So, th so it is the, you know, the, the FAQ documents, they can get quite detailed. And some of them, some uh, working backwards sessions are just focused on one particular area of a product to decide, can we actually go forward with this project due to a new technology that we need to you know, develop or advances in technology that need to happen or something else you know, that the company needs to build? I would just add on to that to say that, um, again, if you, your question is sort of how detailed are the 
requests and information that teams need to share and leaders need to document about the resources they require. And um, uh, I can tell you that I would be very surprised if there are a few companies in the world that ask for more detailed information on this. So when you develop your annual operating plan as a company, even in my case where I had a large global organization spanning more than 1500 people, I had to be able to document um, and uh, be able to answer in detail the breakdown for every single team, teams as small as six people uh, in my company to explain what exactly did that team do and why exactly did I need that many people working on that. And that needs to be documented in your operating plan. So one of the ways that frugality is exhibited is that um, intense scrutiny and clarity so that there's no there was no slop in the system. There was no points for just having, you know, excess people, larger teams. You had to be incredibly, it was a, it's an incredibly tightly run ship. And one of the reasons why the company behaves that way is because its roots and heritage are in retail. And if any of you are from the retail business, you know that the most successful retailers in the world, with the exception of, of the ones that are premium brand ones, are successful because they are so they are amazing operators and amazing at driving out costs because it's a low margin business. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on quickly. We have a lot of questions. So what I'm going to suggest is we take the next two questions together. Uh, one is from Gemma Coles and the other one is from Daniel Truman. So, um, Gemma, will you quickly introduce yourself and followed by Daniel? Then I'm going to go over to um, Mitesh Vakaria and then to Shara Kanakaretna, um, if I may. So, Gemma, are you there? Thanks, Shalini. Um, okay, um, I'm Gemma. Um, I run um, Kiero.com. Um, there's going to be a few of us here today who are running marketplaces with algorithms. Um, it was great to hear about your S team goals and their focus on the user. How many of those are focused on the user? Um, I just wondered if you have any principles for how to balance the marketplace needs of buyers and sellers. So when you're wanting to present the most relevant um, products to buyers whilst delivering the optimum display to the seller who's prepared to pay the most. Thank you. And let me go on to Daniel. Daniel, are you there? Maybe Daniel, you could ask your question and then I'll go on to the next two. Yeah, of course. Hi, I'm, I'm Dan. I'm from CatChat. Um, I'm, I'm actually really interested in the processes which you guys developed, but more so about how you adapted to them. And I guess the biggest challenges you had in transitioning from, let's say, an old style of working to a new one. Great. Thank you very much. Colin, do you want to kick off or...? Um, yeah, sure. For the buyers and sellers, one uh, principle is if you can decouple them and they're separate, I would definitely decouple them and study them individually. Obviously, in a marketplace, that's not always true. And so, you know, at, at Amazon, it typically favors the, the, the buying customer if there's ever a, a tie. Um, Amazon doesn't really like either or, so you want to figure out how you can have your cake and eat it too. But um, in, you know, in terms of the who wins the buy box, that's algorithmically driven. But um, you know, it's price, uh, availability, time to deliver. And it's also based on the, the seller scorecard too. Um, but you know, buyer, um, sellers aren't going to go to a marketplace where there are no buyers. And so if you start from that perspective to say, you, and you need to build it in lockstep, of course, but um, Amazon typically, the, the, the guarantee, for instance, if something goes wrong, they'll make it right uh, with the customer who bought it and then go figure out where the process broke down. Sometimes it's the, sometimes it is the customer, the buyer's fault, but other times it's the seller's fault and they'll go work that issue out with the seller. But, um, but the sell, the buyer does have a hundred percent guarantee that and, and trust in the marketplace. Completely agree with that answer. And just one rule of thumb uh, that I always share with companies, it's the rule of the coin, which is if you're not clear on who your customers just follow the money and the person that's paying you the money, that's your customer. And so in a marketplace, that's the buyer and the sellers are, are um, so that's why the, the jump ball goes to uh, the buyer. And so you can apply this rule to sort of any type of business that you run. Now, of course, to Colin's point, you can't have one without the other. So you have to ideally treat them both as your customer, but, if, but to the point of like, where do you, how do you decide what the jump ball is? who's paying you money versus who are you paying money out to? That's interesting. So our market, we've got um, the people who are advertising their products actually pay us 
and then we've got people who are buying from them for free so it's slightly different to that but um, we're shifting from one to the other so that's really helpful thanks thank you very much thanks thanks Gemma and Daniel thank you also for your question uh, if, if you're happy for me to move on I'd like to move on if I may to Mithesh uh, Vakaria and then I'll come on to the Shara Mithesh are you there I feel that we didn't answer Daniel's question, though. Um, okay, uh, go for it. Go for it. Dan Daniel, Daniel. What, Daniel, I'm sorry, could you restate your question, please? Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, it was about, so when you were transitioning from these old processes to these uh, new ones, what did you guys find the most challenging, or which aspects of it individually did you find challenging? Well, they're all, ch <laughs> change is hard. And so, but, uh, you know, so it, it, it's, it's, I think the important thing is having a growth mindset and, and having your organization and the leaders understand and embrace the idea that um, we are going to try new things and that sometimes those new things will work. And if they work, great, we'll stick with them. But if they don't, we can change. So the simplest example was, is just the using written narratives instead of PowerPoint. Any organization in the world can change tomorrow that's it's really it's it is the least complicated process change you can imagine um will your organization be writing uh, great documents tomorrow when you change no and guess what at amazon we didn't write great documents either but if you uh commit to the change and work on it for several weeks and several months your team and organization will get better and better and better and eventually you'll be writing good documents and you'll be able to operate you know better so I, I would just say that the the it's it's just about having that growth mindset that you know we're going to change we're going to try new things and then understanding that when you change don't expect the don't expect the benefits right away if you start tomorrow on a diet don't expect a, or a marathon training pro program the benefits don't arrive in the first two weeks they arrive several months later so uh, you need to understand and have the right expectations uh, about when the benefits will arrive. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for coming back to me. I, I, I appreciate that. Daniel, is that, do, do you have anything else on that? Otherwise, I'll no, leave over great. to Mithesh. That was perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Mithesh, and then uh, I lost the Sharaf. Hi. Hi, Bill. Uh, hi, Shalini. And, hi, Mithesh. Uh, nice to see you. Everyone. Um, my question was basically, could you explain about the one-way versus two-way door decisions that you have? Yeah, so at Amazon, it's the, one of the first things you ask is, is this a one-way or two-way door for a decision? Because you make a, it's, you use a different decision-making process. So a two-way door is you go through the door, you look and you realize, is this, you know, did I make the right call? If not, you can just go back and, and try something else. So for two-way door type decisions, Speed is more important and course correcting is more important than getting it right up front. So you wanna try, try things and move fast without all the information that you're, you necessarily come, you wish you had more, but speed is more important. So you favor uh, going forward early. A one-way door is you walk through that door, you can't turn around and, and go back or it's very expensive to do so. So where you put a fulfillment center, for instance, it's, a, it's an expensive decision because you're signing uh, you know, long-term leases, you're, you know, you're in labor agreements, you're working with governments, where, you know, where the next uh, airport in London should be or like which, which run, where the next runway should be, that is a hard decision to go back on once you make that call. And so I think that what Amazon does pretty well up front is they ask, is it a one-way or two-way door? decision because a lot of companies just use the the one-way door decision making framework uh, to make two-way door type decisions and that just puts a lot of extra analysis that you don't necessarily need because some things you just have to try and it may fail but you have to try and if it works you double down on it if it doesn't you you pivot or move on or just try something different i would just add uh, agree with everything colin said i would just add one thing which is that um there are, uh, Colin was pointing out there are examples where people focus too much on, on uh, being too deliberate, but there are examples when people are actually, uh, we see this a lot in the startup community and tech community, 
uh, an opposite example where people treat um, software development engineering decisions uh, using agile and sprint methodology and think that those and think of that as one way door decisions, uh, sorry, two way door decisions. And I would argue that in fact, while of course, in many ways they are reversible, um, I would argue that they really are one way door because you, no different than if you're gonna launch a new fulfillment center, you're in a tech company, in most cases, the most valuable and scarce resource you have is your software development engineering. And if you just deploy them without a uh, great thought about what is the most effective way to deploy um, your engineering team, then I think that um, you're, you're misusing your resources. We actually wrote an article about this. Um, I'm posting it into the chat now, if anyone wants to read it. Thank, thank you, thank you for answering that question, thank you. Uh, Mithesh, can I just say a great question? I didn't know about the one-way and two-way door, so I'm going to read that article if I may, Bill. Uh, so thank you very much for asking that question. And now uh, I'd like to go over quickly to Pashara Kanakaretna. She's an investor and an advisory board member of E2E. And the final question I think we'll be able to take uh, is from Alessandro. Um, so Tashara, over to you. Yes, I just wanted to quickly share a few thoughts. Um, Bill and Colleen, thank you so much for such a marvelous presentation and for um, providing insights into areas that are so important for entrepreneurs and investors. Um, so Good to Great has been my Bible since 2000. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur uh, and a technologist, um, had the fortune of starting three companies ground up and doing it at scale. And now um, I support a lot of entrepreneurs and um, I have about 150 plus companies in my portfolio. So as you were saying, you know, joking, you said, well, you know, good to great is the second greatest book. I got it, what you were saying. And I think it's going to be a marvelous book for my portfolio CEOs and leadership. So you can imagine what they're going to be getting in the next few weeks from me. Uh, but the second one, is really interesting. My 23 year old son, my youngest, he graduated last year from a British university and he started, uh, he's actually a car designer, but he got pulled into a tech company. Uh, you know, being the pandemic, he just took it on. And um, it's, a, it's a startup on scale. And he's the youngest member on the team and he had to, he does all the research and different things. So he had mentioned to me about this memo concept of Amazon. And I told him, oh, you know, let's park it. I'd like to learn more. So I can't tell you how excited I was when you were describing it today at length. Um, again, it's just such an amazing best practice and a very effective, productive one. So I just wanted to thank you for um, taking the time today to share with us um, your learnings and to being so concise. Um, I think that would be really helpful. The one part I would love to learn more and get your thoughts at some point, not today. Um, I obsess about leadership, productivity, effectiveness, making people successful. But my new obsession has been about failure. So sometime I would love an opportunity to discuss more with you all about failure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tashara. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to talk to Bill and Colin afterwards to see whether they'd be happy to chat to you about failure. But I think one of the messages that we're trying to give as E to E is we should celebrate failure because it's through failure that we have our learnings and we pick up ourselves and start again for the next one. And I think there is a big difference between the US and the UK on that. Uh, I think the US are much more okay with failure than we are in the UK. Um, so we need to improve as a country on that one is my personal view. Um, so, Tashara, I don't know if you wanted to comment anything, Bill and Colin, and before we move over to Alessandro. No, we can talk about failure all day. Uh, you know, okay. we have a lot of, <laughs> lot of examples. We failed a lot. We have a lot of examples in the book. It describes some of our personal failures at Amazon. And um, uh, the um, I'm a huge believer that um, if you hire someone who hasn't actually had, you know, substantial failures in their career, that um, uh, that's probably not someone you should hire because they, they probably haven't learned very much. Fair enough, that's, that's put it very, very clearly. Thank you very much for that, um, Bill. 
Um, Tashara, thank you again. I'm going to move over final question, if I may, to Alessandro. Uh, uh, Alessandro, hi, and um, would you introduce yourself? Thank you. Yeah, hi, Shalini. Thank you. Uh, I'm the co-founder of a, of a travel marketplace called Musement, which was recently acquired by, by TUI. So I'm now part of a large organization. We were 300 people, now we're part of a 6,000 people group. So a lot of changes. My question was about uh, uh, OKR, so Objective and Key Results Framework uh, that is used uh, by many successful digital companies. So do I understand correctly that Amazon never uh, went that way? And if that's actually the case, I was wondering if you could share any perspective on why that was the case, why you decided to uh, not use that framework, for example. And obviously, thank you so much for the amazing insights that you've been sharing today. Yeah, in terms of the operating uh, cadence that Amazon has, some groups have experimented with o OKRs, but Amazon's overall operating cadence that um, it, it's called the operation OP1 and OP2 process. So it's a yearly planning process where every group writes a narrative, which is a deep dive about their, and it has their objectives and, and key results, how they're going to be measured. And then Amazon has those S team goals that Bill talked about, which are essentially a distillation of all of the OP1 plans. You know, it's a bottom up plan from the group and the S team tracks what are the most important uh, goals for the company that we want to make sure we hit. And then has a regular process throughout the year to, to, to go and, and measure progress along those goals. So, uh, you know, I guess the, you, there, there are different ways to, 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 to do this. Um, OKRs is one, Amazon's uh, annual OP1 and OP2 plus S-team uh, goals is another one. I would say to an organization is the most important thing is pick one. Um, you get your goals, make sure you hold people accountable to what they are and put mechanisms in to, to, you know, to measure and monitor those. You sometimes need to audit. Um, also and dive deep on those uh, across the year. But the, I think the high order bit is pick one. And, and if it's not working from you, there are a couple of other uh, uh, viable options to choose from. We're not experts on OKRs um, and uh, you know, use them in other organizations, but and we just talk about what Amazon has, has used. And you know, I think it's worthy of study and, um, and uh, you know, organizations, small and large can use it, but OKRs work great for plenty of companies too. Yeah, I think it's just one example of the many frameworks that all basically attempt to allow an organization to do the same thing, which is to figure out, you know, uh, and define uh, a direction and define the actual work that they're going to do. And Amazon, when I was at Procter & Gamble at the beginning of my career, there was something called OGSM, Objective Goal Strategy Measure. It's just a different... And I'm sure if people worked at GE for a long time, they would have something that they that they called it. Uh, you know, if you if you talk to a hundred of the greatest companies in the history of business, they would have something that sounds like OKR. It's 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 just a framework to do it. Amazon has a different framework that that gets you to the same place. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Um, for me, I have learned so many things today. I, I can see from the chat function, people want to know more, but we're running out of time right now. So I'm gonna hand over to Steve just to do uh, a, a short um, closing and then I will do my vote of thanks. And then I think what I'm encouraging is everybody with more questions to send them across to me, but if the answers are in working backwards, I think you have to get the book if you haven't got it already, but um, Bill and Colin, you will see in the chat function, people are saying we're buying the book. So um, it's been very, very valuable. and. Uh, I feel this has been, we run roughly 45, 50 events a year online at the moment. Uh, this has been one of the most educational, practically learning tips, understanding how to apply what to think, two door policy, one door policy. These are sorts of things you can't get anywhere else. Um, so I can't thank you enough um, for um, really uh, enabling us such great learning in such a short period of time. Um, Steve, um, massive thank you to you again. As I said at the beginning, I couldn't have done this without you. So would you like to say anything? The only thing I'll say is just thank you to Bill and Colin for being so generous with their time, their insights. Um, the book itself is phenomenal. I did write a, a press release that said this would be the best E2E gathering ever. Colin and I, when we first spoke, he said, if you got 20 people together, it'd be successful. So we've got a lot of really rich people with some great questions. 
They know they can go to your website, workingbackwards.com to get some further information. But the book itself is going to become the Bible. It's on my shelf. It'll be uh, continue to be on my shelf. My team now reads it. We all preach it to each other. We're moving up that scale. So thank you both of you gentlemen for everything you provided to everybody. So I'm going to say move over, good to great. And um, up, uh, up there is working backwards. That's the next big business leader, as Tara mentioned earlier. So thank you again. I'd like to say thank you also to my advisory board directors. There's quite a few on today. Um, Philip Bamaskal, Craig Goodfellow, Demetrius Hastis, Bashara. Um, they are uh, investors in our business. They help it to grow. Um, we will take away your learning and discuss it at the next advisory board meeting. And I'm sure they're going to keep me in check to say, am I implying these principles? I'd also like to say thank you to all of you um, please keep an eye on our website uh, we've got roughly I think um, three four events in June three events in July uh, at least two in May so just keep a keep a eye on the website if you're not a premium member please become one it's a 300 pounds a year very well spent and um, you're uh, helping the UK economy through through supporting us um, and please keep in touch with us. So thank you again to everyone. And finally, I'd like to say it's always great to have my mum on. Uh, she is my inspiration. So mommy, thank you. Thanks everyone. Speak to you soon. Okay. See you.